um, so yeah, thank you for doing this. Uh, while it's almost midnight for you, I guess, in, in Chennai, India. <laughs> um, so let me just mention that Santosh did his PhD in my group uh, last June. And now he joined the uh, Center for Quantum Information and Quantum Control in Toronto. Um, uh, since like, I guess, uh, February or something. And um, <clears throat> Okay, so today he's gonna, so his work has led to like a nice series of four papers in a row in physical review, um, which is the topic of his, uh, his, um, his talk today. So with further, without further ado, Santosh, go ahead and take it away. Oh, thank you, Walter. Thanks for inviting me to the talk. You know, I was on the other side of the table listening to talks and this is the first time on this side of the talk. So as a disclaimer, the Power seems to be super erratic at the place I am. So if I zone out or if things get, um, you know, turned off, I apologize for that before in hand. All right. So uh, anyway, so as Walter was uh, saying, this work was done with uh, collaboration with obviously with Walter. This is part of my PhD, which led to an interesting bunch of four papers, which started as a exploratory project of a single system that we were studying led to a series of things that we never imagined would have happened and you know, turned on to do a beautiful set of um, papers. So to start with the outline of the talk, uh, whenever you have a question, please do, uh, don't mind to interrupt me in between or speak in between. I'm looking at my iPad and I might miss what's happening on the screen over here. So uh, the outline of the talk is, I'm going to give an introduction of what topology actually means in quantum mechanics. Uh, we had a bunch of interesting seminars even last semester with Vanderbilt and everyone giving an introduction of what it is. Uh, I'm going to add on to that and introduce one thing that we haven't much thought about, which is a system called abstracted topological systems. And then I'll go to honeycomb systems, I mean, group five systems placed on honeycomb lattices, which essentially is a surrogate real system for placing p orbitals in a honeycomb lattice. And the papers pertaining to that are given over here, the three papers. And then finally, one thing we discovered while working with this system is an universal property of uh, annihilating Dirac fermions, which leads to this topological transition and it's universal throughout any system that people are working with. And that paper is given out in the last one and that will be the last part of the talk. All right. So what exactly is topology in a quantum system? And as far as this talk is concerned, I'm, I've tried to minimize the number of equations that one needs to understand it. And mostly it's visual and verbal things that I'm going to put forth. So in any general topological, in any general quantum crystal, we know that we have a bunch of uh, uh, wave functions, which can be represented in different bases we choose. Them. And one such basis is indeed the block function, where you have a bunch of wave functions, which are periodic and inside a single unit cell. And there exists another notion, which is very paramount to the talk that we are going to have, which is called the Vanier functions or the Vanier bases. And these bases actually are related in the way that I'm going to tell you right now. So given a bunch of band structure that you see over here, to each band and K point, you have a wave function associated with it. And integrating this wave function throughout a real space along this band gives you a representation, which is called the Vanier representation, or essentially what you are trying trying to do is attach to this a real space representation of a wave function to each band that you see over here in the Brillouin zone. Interestingly, once you have this representation, there is, you'll find that you don't have a unique way of representing this in a real space and you have a gauge freedom that you are left with. And what one can usually do is use this gauge freedom to localize this wave function in real space. Or again, the big goal that we are trying to achieve here is take a band structure and pick a band and then convert it into a real space such that it's completely localized in real space. It was assumed that one can always do this to any given bunch of bands or to any given bunch of band structure. And this is often called localized Vanier functions or the functions you get out of doing this is called localized Vanier functions. So to uh, give an example of this in a model system, which most of us are familiar with, which is the 1D SSH model, which is made up of two atoms, say blue and red, connected by a bond T prime and connected outside the unit cell by a bond T. 
both having an on-site potential given by E1 and E2. So in a case, here I give three such examples of possible band structures that this system could have. And let's first concentrate on this one, on this one, and later come to this one. In this band structure that you see over here, what we have essentially done is change the value of E1 and E2 so large such that the energy levels of the blue one and red one don't interact with each other at all. An example of this kind of system is uh, sodium chloride, or I put in lithium fluoride on any ionic kind of system where one of the electron is passed on to the other one. So the lowest occupied band structure or the lowest occupied band is taken by only one atom in this uh, unit. Sir. So if we do a one year localized one year function of this band, the lowest occupied band, it's pretty clear that the electron, which is the Vanier center or the wave function in real space is going to lie, the occupied electron is going to lie in one of the lowest potential atom or where E1 or E2, which one is lower over here. So this is one such example. And second, but more curious example is the one where you have, instead of, uh, let's give the E1 and E2 same, but now change T1 and T2 or T prime and T over here. In this case, we have changes such that the unit cell, the bond that goes out of the unit cell is stronger than the bond that goes inside the unit cell. And now you clearly see that once you plot the band structure and project it on or weight it, color it by the um, contribution from each of your atom, you see that the lowest energy band is made up of a mixture of both red and blue. So now if you try to plot or try to convert the wave function of this band inside the real space and try to localize it, this electron is going to sit in between the bonds, in between the stronger bonds. Essentially, what this means is it's a pretty simple picture of where you have uh, two hydrogen atoms and once you put them together, you see that the electrons are being shared between the hydrogen atom by a bonding state and an anti-bonding state. And what we have here is technically a bonding state of the system in a more chemical picture that we have over here. So this is often called atomic obstruction just because of the fact that the electron does not sit inside on top of the atom that we want, but rather in between the atoms that we see over here. And the third and more uh, curious case is what happens when T1 equals T2. In this case, you have a band crossing over here. And now your notion of what an occupied band is or an unoccupied band is kind of destroyed because you have a metallic system. And hence the notion of localizing Vanier functions or localizing your electron in a metallic system breaks down because you have a metallic system where your electrons can free flow in throughout your lattice or it's spread out throughout your lattice. Okay, so which we previously assumed that for every given band structure, you will always have an exponentially localized Vanier bands. It was changed in 2007 in an interesting paper written by actually Vanderbilt and a bunch of guys in Switzerland, where they realized that for topological insulators, one can never exponentially localize a Vanier function while respecting all the symmetries inside the crystal. And this was a big leap through because this in turn turns out that you can use the reverse to define what a topological insulator is. What you can instead say is, it turns out the other way is true to where any system where the exponentially localized Vanier function cannot be made while respecting the symmetries are guaranteed to be a topological insulators. For example, let's take the example of the famous example of graphene, where you open up a gap in Dirac cone with uh, spin orbit coupling, which breaks the time reversal symmetry, okay, uh, in spin orbit coupling. So here you have a bunch of bands, which is made up of a spin up band and a spin down band, both in, um, both without degenerate, and which previously used to be a Dirac cone in graphene, is now opened up because of the spin orbit coupling in your system. One interesting thing, what happens because of this Vanier representation, is that if you try to localize one of the band and the other band inside the unit cell, what ultimately turns out to happen is that the spin-up band settles down in one of the atom and the spin-down band settles down in the other atom. And for the other band, it happens in the opposite way. So in the net system, the net magnetic moment in the system is still conserved and the system is still non-magnetic as you would expect it to be. But the individual bands break this time reversal symmetry when you try to localize this on one of the particular atom. So this in turn is an example of where in a non-trivial topological system, when you try to exponentially localize the Vanier function, you either can localize it by breaking the symmetry or you cannot localize it without breaking the symmetry. Um, okay. So this notion of uh, localizing 
I mean, this no yeah. notion of opening a gap up by spin orbit coupling has been existing for a long time, and that's the usual notion of uh, topological systems that strong topological systems that most of us are familiar with. But there exists other class of systems where instead of uh, knotting the topological not, knotting your band structure, you know, traveling your band through spins or opening the gap up through spin orbit coupling. What can one instead do is open a gap up using real space symmetries or real space interactions. And one such example is what we saw in the first one, where we opened up a gap up just by pure starting an interaction between two sets of orbitals. So here is an example again of a 1D model, which is given by either SSH 1D chain or a or 1D lattice of S and P orbital together. In this case, this is the same previous band structure that we saw over here. And how do you detect if this is a trivial band structure or to that of a topologically non-trivial band structure? And one easy way to do that is obviously in this case, because we clearly know one is an S component and one is a P component, we can plot it in those colors and see that we have had a band inversion or technically what we call a knot in these kind of wave functions that you have plotted over here. And another interesting, more interesting way which can be applied to a much more universal class of systems is to look at one of the eigenvalue of the symmetries that's being broken or that's being preserved in the system. Sorry, that's being preserved in the system. In this case, it's the inversion symmetry that it's being knotted with respect to. So we have an orbital S, which is even with respect to inversion, an orbital P, which is odd with respect to inversion. Now, if you go to the band structure and place yourself in one of the high symmetry points where the inversion is still preserved, meaning either zero or pi, in the blue line zone, you still have a clear notion of what an inversion symmetry is. Because essentially, in between those points, we have no notion of what an inversion symmetry is. And over here, and go and look at the eigenvalue of this inversion for these wave functions. If the eigenvalue of these inversions are inverted, meaning you have a plus eigenvalue here and a minus eigenvalue here, essentially what you have detected is you have a S like character in this point and a P like character in this point, which means there definitely needs to have an inversion happening between those two points. Um, so this is an example of what people call a topological crystalline insulator, while where you have a crystal symmetry that's being preserved and that's causing your knottedness in your case space. Okay, so just now we saw that um, all topologically non-trivial insulators or systems where you can't localize a Vanier function without preserving any symmetry. Uh, with preserving all the all your symmetries. But yet, just in the previous slide, we saw that in a chain of SP atoms or SSH model, we have localized the atoms in one of the bond center or your other strongest bond center, and yet we claimed it to be topological. So what happens is that even though I said all non-trivially, all uh, band structures which cannot be localized by preserving the symmetry are non-trivial, the other way it's not wrong, meaning, other way it's not true, meaning, all non vanier representable bands are topological, but not all vanier representable bands are trivial. Meaning if you can represent a band by localizing it, it doesn't mean it belongs to the trivial class. It can still be a non-trivial class. And how do you go about understanding all these bunch of um, classes of which can be represented, which cannot be represented and which could be potentially have a non-trivial topology. So this was, given in one of the paper, which one of the famous paper in 2017, Nature Paper, which is called the topological quantum chemistry. The big idea here is to use what's called an elementary band representation, which I'm not going to go into details about, but one can use these classes of elementary band representation, which goes beyond the usual tenfold classification that people are familiar with, which is the uh, continuous symmetry, like time reversal symmetry, particle hole symmetry, or charge conjugation symmetry, or those kind of symmetries, and includes crystal symmetries like CN, or uh, inversion or any kind of symmetries. So there the biggest classification that comes is you have an insulator, which can be non-trivial, which we call the non-trivial insulators. And these are insulators where there exists no one year representation that can be localized by preserving the symmetry. And all your usual K-theoretic topological insulator, topological crystalline insulator, like churn insulator, mirror churn insulator falls under this category. And then you have a class of insulators called atomic insulators. And these are the usual kind of insulators you come across in everyday life. And these are split again between two sets of categories, which is called the trivial atomic insulator. And these are insulators where once you localize your one-year representation, these uh, localized one-year centers sit on top of your atoms. And the example we saw is the sodium chloride or ionic kind of crystals where the uh, occupied electron sits on one atom, but it's not shared between two atoms. And then comes the obstructed atomic insulators. And these are insulators where the Vanier centers 
actually form a different position than the atoms where they are at. And one example we actually saw is the SSH. And SSH is kind of a unique system because this applies even beyond 1D where 2D and 3D and SSH can belong to both non-trivial and obstructed automated limit, but that's beyond the point. And then the third kind of insulators are fragile insulators. And these insulators turn to be one year representable or can be localized if and only if you combine it with another system where, which is made up of trivial uh, bands. And this is a very interesting and complex class of system which was formed by uh, Ashwin uh, two years ago and has been explored uh, quite a big time last year. And then this notion of what you call as one year obstructability or non-representability of one year function has now been extended even to the class of topological superconductors where you uh, redefine your one year obstruction in instead of electron in your Majorana modes. Okay, so the big key idea that we have taken away from this is that wave functions of band insulators can be noted with respect to some symmetries as you saw, it's either inversion symmetry in case of SSH or any other real space symmetries or in the case of graphene where we have a spin orbit coupling and with respect to time reversal symmetry over there. And then these nodes can be detected by looking at the eigenvalues of the symmetry and the symmetry preserving K points. So one key point here is whatever symmetry that's being uh, causing this knottedness of the system can, can be detected and the knottedness can be detected at the points where these symmetries are preserved in the K points. In case of SSH, it was the inversion which was being preserved at zero or pi in your Brillouin zone or which is the same in case of spin orbit coupling, it's protected at all your, or the inversion eigenvalue, spin orbit eigenvalue, spin time reversal eigenvalue is still valid at all your time reversal invariant momentas. And one other major thing is the entire classification we saw here is that all these insulators are classified differently. And the, the reason to do that is any boundary between any of these uh, in class of insulators you see, will always guarantee an edge mode between them. And that's why they all are topologically distinct insulators or topologically distinct systems. And thus, system with different nodes or topologically different and ends are connected by a boundary mode because you cannot smoothly translate between either one of these systems or between these systems. Okay. So with these or with this repertoire in our hand, we can now go to uh, the big picture that we are trying to pose over here, which is we are going to start with antimony, which we are going to use as a surrogate model for PX, PY, PZ orbitals in a honeycomb lattice. And we'll show that when this honeycomb lattice or PX, PY, PZ, when it's placed in a honeycomb lattice, which is completely flat, the system will be is always will always be in a nodal line semi-metallic state. And once you start introducing slight buckling in this uh, honeycomb lattice, you'll see that this nodal line semi-metal will turn into a Dirac semi-metal which is pretty interesting because one would expect that this would be a trivial insulator as we will see. And then finally, once you keep on buckling, the system turns into an insulator, but instead of a trivial insulator, the system will now be a higher order topological insulator, which we haven't seen what it is right now, but I'll explain it later on as we go. And more crucially, it becomes an obstructed atomic insulator or the kind of insulator we just saw right now. Okay, so here is uh, the structure of the system that we are going to study. We are going to use, as always, the group five element, which is the antimony and arsenic as a surrogate model for this toy system, which is good because you only have is a PX, PY, PZ toy system, which can actually be realized in a real system. And interestingly, these things have been made experimentally in both completely flat form as well as buckled form. So if you look over here, antimony or arsenic or group five system is exactly one electron extra than your carbon, which is your usual suspect graphene as made up of uh, in the honeycomb lattice. So you have one extra electron. Interestingly, in graphene, since the S orbital and P orbital are close in energy to it itself, what happens is we have a sp3 hybridization happening in the system and you are left with one electron which is being occupied by your PZ bands. Uh, but in the case of antimony, the S orbital or the group five elements of even arsenic and antimony, the S orbitals lie deep enough that your P orbitals that we want to describe, which is the PX, PY, and PZ, form a separate set of band manifold, which we can now model as a model Hamiltonian and study its properties. So here's actually the crux of the talk that we are going to have. Once you put a PZ orbital in a honeycomb lattice, that's the usual graphene band structure that you're all familiar with, where you have a Dirac point coming in that. And this is the graphene that we are all 
And in 2008, Boo and Dash Sharma came up with an other interesting model where they, instead of putting PZ orbital in a honeycomb lattice, they studied what happens when you put in PX and PY in a honeycomb lattice. It turns out you have the same kind of Dirac cone happening in this band manifold, just like in the case of graphene. So just to give you an idea, your system is made up of two atoms in your unit cell. Hence, if you put in PZ orbital, you have two such PZ orbital and you have two bands that gives it. And if you have PX and PY for each of your atom, you have two such atoms and you have four such bands. And two of these bands form uh, an point. And it's interestingly, this becomes a representation of P plus, uh, PX plus IPY and PX minus IPY and people are interested. Now, our goal is to put these two together and study what happens when you put PX, PY, and PZ together in an address. And by directly just looking at it, this is what you expect. Uh, where you exactly put one on top of the other, with a difference in the energy ba uh, energy barrier between them. And this is so, uh, nothing happens and nothing interacts with each other just because we have a completely flat system and PX, PY form a separate group with respect to mirror symmetry than your PZ. Essentially, you have a PZ orbital pointing out which cannot interact with the PX and PY orbital. So these band structures, when combined with each other, do not interact or do not open a gap up or do not gap the system at all. And this is what we expect. So interestingly, because these systems do not open a gap out, and in a realistic system, let's look at what the real band structure of this antimony is and how it actually maps to what we are studying right now. So here is the DFT band structure of uh, antimony that you see over here. And you have the S orbitals that we saw, which in graphene will be close to your P orbitals and hybridize with each other. But in case of antimony and arsenic, as I said, the S orbitals are deep enough that you can completely ignore what happens at this energy level. And what we are focused on is going to be this energy level that you see over here, where you, you see a bunch of uh, six bands, PX, PY, PZ, PX, PY, PZ, a bunch of six bands. And that is going to be our Hamiltonian that we are going to describe it. So you see the two sets of Dirac points which are being caused by PX, PY. Okay, just to note the color here, the blue color here is PZ, the red color and the green color belongs to PX and PY. So you see a Dirac cone that's being formed by a usual graphene that you just saw over here. And then you have a Dirac cone that's being formed by your PX and PY orbital that was like who on Das or mine did the bending model we are going to look at. And you have your Fermi level interestingly placed in between those two Dirac systems that you see over here. And what essentially happens is, this is a pretty interesting system in its, itself, apart from the topological properties, just because you have a cone that's pointing on one direction and a cone that's pointing on another direction, which you would think creates a circle or the intersection of whose, uh, these two things, would, you would expect it to be a circle. But instead, these things are far apart with each other that the fact that you have a Dirac cone or like linear dispersion breaks on and you need to go beyond linear dispersion and have your quadratic terms, which introduces something called trigonal warping. And this in turn creates a very interesting pattern, such like pattern in the nodal line. And because of the fact that this entire system is strictly planar, we have a mirror symmetry that's along the XY plane. So any Hamiltonian term or the interaction between PZ and PXY is going to be zero. And thus these two Dirac cones, which where one is formed by PXY orbital and the one that's formed by PZ orbital that you see over here, cannot interact and you have uh, nodal line semi-metal that's being created over here. And this has very interesting transport properties that is given there in this paper that we're not going to go over. Okay, so this is the structure and this is the nodal line semi-metal that we have in a completely flat PX, PY, PZ orbital in a honeycomb lattice. Now let's buckle the system. And by buckling the system, what we have essentially done is move one of the atom on top on one of the atom bottom, and you have a buckled system in this case, and we have broken the mirror symmetry that we previously had. And now the PZ and PXY can interact with each other because they no longer or uh, have different symmetry representations with respect to the mirror symmetry, and hence can open a gap up. But what turns out to happen is, here is the band structure that you see, or that we got out of DFT after buckling. And we were surprised that you still have these kind of crossings that you previously thought out to be nodal line semi-metal. And we were surprised that the nodal line semi-metal, what you would have expected is this entire node to be gapped just because they both can interact with each other now. And it turns out if you actually look at the 3D plot of these 
band structure or in the entire two dimensional brillouin zone it turns out that you don't have a nodal line semi metal but rather a bunch of six dirac points uh, where the nodal line has gap throughout the system except for six points that you see over here which was pretty surprising to us because why would what is the symmetry or this definitely cannot be an accidental t general symmetry there is a certain symmetry at play over here and then we went ahead and labeled the band structure and studied what the symmetry representation of each of the wave functions could be and we found out that these two bands in the direction from m to k and k to gamma actually belong to two different symmetry groups with respect to a c2 symmetry which means they would belong to two different elementary representations and cannot interact with each other but only along the line m to gamma and gamma to k on these two lines but throughout other places in the brillouin zone they can interact and gap out hence you have these kind of six dirac cones around a k point or six path from k to 1m k to 1 gamma and k to next unit cell or these kind of things so once we start buckling the system or once we buckle the system we move from a nodal line semi metal to a dirac semi metal at this point um so dr so you broke up a bit oh, yeah. you were telling us for the symmetry could you just tell us what the symmetry was again oh yeah so the symmetry that preserves this thing is a c2 symmetry which essentially if you have a bunch of buckled dirac uh, buckled antimony hexagonal lattice which is this is an up atom and this is a down atom as you know mm -hmm. and this is the symmetry c2 symmetry that preserves the dirac cones or this is what it's respect to different with respect and once you twist it do a c2 the uh, yellow goes to yellow and the blue goes to blue and everything remains the same okay. and the symmetry is preserved throughout uh, along the line in a brillouin okay yeah uh so one interesting thing about dirac cones is that it cannot be a single one which means every other dirac cone you see here uh, or okay and the reason for that is each dirac cone to each dirac cone you can associate something called a topological charge which i won't go into detail but would love to discuss with you guys is uh the winding number associated with each of the dirac cone and it can take either a positive or a negative number in this case for a single dirac cone it's going to be a plus 1 or a minus 1 charge hence the net system the 2d system that we have to have a zero topological charge the dirac cone must always occur in pair and as you saw over here here is your k point and these are the lines along which your c2 symmetries are going to be preserved in the brillouin zone or in your k space and along each of those lines from gamma to k and k to m you have a bunch of dirac cones that are being seen over here and here i have plotted along with it the charge or the topological charge winding number associated with each of the dirac cones that you see over here and you have bunch of six dirac cones and the system in the first brillouin zone is riddled with a bunch of dirac cones and what i'm not going to have in the slide is this becomes a very interesting uh, play field for having surface state that connect each of your dirac cones just in case of like graphene but instead of graphene where you just have six dirac cones you have multiple dirac cones over here where throughout any cut you make in your system you are bound or guaranteed to have surface state which we show in the paper that's given over here but i'm not going to go into details about that but okay so you have bunch of positively and negatively bound dirac cones over here one interesting point okay so leaving these entire set of discussion we had right now and jump into another set of direction which will be related to what we are talking right now so here let's talk about a toy model a model in which you have two dirac cones in a same two band model with both positive and negative charge it was shown by montagu that uh, i guess in 2009 that this form of hamiltonian where you have two dirac cones with a plus or minus charge in a two band model takes a universal form that's given by over here and this is a pretty interesting form as you see over here one immediate interesting thing that you see here mm -hmm. is you have a quadratic dispersion along one of your k space direction and a linear dispersion along the other space other direction and this essentially what it does is this leaves a line kx invariant in your system or you have a symmetry line symmetry in your system which leaves an entire line kx invariant or you have your h of kx hamiltonian of kx is going to be the same as h of minus kx in this case 
So this is one line symmetry that we have in this model Hamiltonian that we see over here that leaves a k-space line invariant. And the second important symmetry that's relevant to us is that the mass term or the sigma z term or the on-site potential term in this Hamiltonian is zero, in which case the chiral symmetry is preserved in the system. And what happens is, and the main point of this paper is that using, once you have this universal form which they derive, you can show that the parameters you have in the system D controls the movement of these Dirac cones. And the reason that these Dirac cones can move is because these Dirac cones are preserved by the chiral symmetry and the line invariant symmetry, which means throughout the line where they are going to move, this system, this Dirac cones cannot be gapped throughout the line that they are going to move in. So these, the only way to gap the two Dirac cones that you see here is to take them to the midpoint or move them close enough in the intercritical point and then merging the two charges or the plus or minus one charges and taking a zero charge system out of this, out of the bands that you have. And, oops. Uh, sorry, Santosh, I have another question. Uh, what, what is PY over there? Uh, yeah, PY here uh, denotes the strength of your linear dispersion in your Dirac cone. So the M controls the mass of your final state. Okay. Uh -huh. Your yeah, D right. controls the position, yeah, of uh, Dirac. And then the PY controls the velocity of your uh, dispersion of your Dirac cones. Okay. Um, oh yeah, you had a question. Okay. And interestingly, there are uh, tons of paper exploring this particular phase, especially because this critical phase that you see over here has a very interesting property that it's made up of both massive and massless Dirac cone at the same point. So it's massive along one of the direction and massless along the other direction, which is a pretty interesting state for a system to be in. Uh, and has interesting transport properties. But what the other guys missed actually, uh, is a recent paper that we just published that's given over here, is the fact that uh, this has a much more richer phase diagram than just the two merging that you see here. And indeed the final insulator that you get out of here is not a trivial insulator, but rather an abstracted atomic insulator. And what's so special about it, that's what we are going to see. Oops. Okay. So here turns the complete, here is the complete phase diagram of the system uh, that we have shown over here for the Hamiltonian that we have. So the phase one corresponds to where you have positive D. Uh, actually, I think this is reversed in the um, latest paper we have. Uh, M should be over here and D should be over here. This should be the positive, positive axis. But anyway, regardless of which you have the first phase, the gap phase, which you have a completely gap system. But if you go ahead and look at the boundary made up of such a system, you'll see that these two systems actually belong to a system that's just like SSH. Or indeed, you have a system where you have non-trivial winding number even after it's being gapped in the insulator. And this corresponds to having surface state in your system or having a insulator where if you cut the 1D edge, you have surface state throughout your system or not a trivial insulator. And the corresponding two limits, when one is positive and one is negative, turns out that these Dirac cones correspond to having surface state in between your Dirac cones and away from your Dirac cones. And this usually manifests in real system like graphene and actually depends on where you cut your edge. In terms of uh, armchair or zigzag or bearded edges that you usually see in different papers, and the edges, edge state that are being connected by a Dirac cone exactly correspond to these two states that you see over here. And indeed, we will see that a buckled honeycomb actually belongs to a state or the completely buckled honeycomb belongs to a state that's given over here. And that's what the connection is between all the previous papers that you saw on this one over here. Okay, so how to show this uh, universality or how to show that there exists three kind of these three phases. And in this paper, we have shown it through three different ways. One is by using completely symmetry arguments uh, where you invoke different symmetries in your system and talk about the little groups and large groups that correspond to it. And the second, we did it by actually calculating the uh, very phase or the exact phase of the system. And actually there is a third category, which I have missed away, which is through the entanglement spectrum of this Hamiltonian. And we are going to take the fourth route, which is given in the paper too, which is just directly looking at the wave functions that correspond to this Hamiltonian that you see over here. This is a pretty easy two by two Hamiltonian, which you can diagonalize. And here are the wave functions that you, uh, eigen, eigenvalues are the eigenwave functions of the system that you see over here. And our goal is now going to plot 
eigen wave function of the system according to the different variables we have which is d m and p y and look at the different states that the system can be in and it turns out that if you plot the phase which is an actual you have two dirac cones in your system here you see okay so to explain this plot let me explain what this is you have your ky and kx and ky blue line zone and you have the color of your you have a wave function which is made up of a single parameter your theta value and this theta value uniquely determines your wave function so for each k associated you can represent your wave function uniquely by your theta value and that's all is determined determines your wave function and we are plotting the value of theta throughout this blue line zone and this indeed turns out to be the face of your wave and you see that once you plot it in your dirac system or the limit where you have two dirac cones in your system you see your wave function actually goes from minus pi i mean some value to minus pi and then has a branch cut where it appears from pi to zero since this is a uh, angle you have regular periodic branches that go throughout your system you have minus pi to pi repeating again from pi to to by blah 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 it goes on repeating over here so this system actually has a value which goes to pi and then comes back from your um, other branch and joins in over here and this kind of discontinue have discontinuity happens outside the dirac points where you see or where you have your dirac points and it turns out in real systems this discontinuity actually correspond to picking up a face or uh, picking up a zac face in your system or by zac face or which is related to the winding number or at these k points or throughout this line your system behaves as if it is like an ssh model with a non trivial winding number hence you are guaranteed a edge state that corresponds to the branch cut that you see over here and that's the reason that you see over here the branch cut or the wave uh, edge state that goes out of your uh, dirac cones that you see here and if this is the conduction band then the valence band of the same system has a branch cut in between your dirac cones and the way you choose the system is in phase 2 or phase 4 or essentially if the edge state are going to be connected outside your dirac cones or inside your dirac cones is determined by exactly which of these wave function correspond to the conduction band and which one corresponds to the valence band so in phase 2 this is going to be your conduction band or your lower band where your electrons or your edge state appears outside your dirac cones and in phase 3 this is going to be your lower band or your occupied band where your edge state occurs between your dirac now visually imagine one changing the value of d in your system or moving the dirac cones closer and closer to each other and just by looking at it you can pretty clearly see that these branch cuts are going to extend and extend and finally when the dirac cones merge at zero the point kx and ky equal to zero you see that one of the system is left with a branch cut throughout your system while the other doesn't have a branch cut. and this leads to having a system where you have a surface state throughout your system or the obstructed atomic limit or again by calculating the winding number of your system you acquire a phase hence a winding number of 1 and not a 0 and hence you are guaranteed a surface state in a system when it is cut parallel to these edges so even though you have a gap insulator this gap insulator is not a trivial insulator but rather an obstructed atomic insulator and so you one can we show that using sewing matrix theory you can derive an invariant to see which phase you are at and again i referred to the paper of how to look at this but it essentially boils down to looking at the this system preserves the this hamiltonian preserves the inversion eigen value or preserves inversion symmetry so one can look at the inversion eigen value of your system at the points where inversion is still a good symmetry to look at and these points are gamma x1 m and x2 in the system and once you look at the inversion eigen values and take a product of it if it turns out to be minus 1 or 1 you can figure out if you are going to be in the semi metallic phase or the obstructed atomic limit phase in the system and also one can do a better thing of actually calculating numerically the um zac phase of your uh, of this hamiltonian and you will indeed get that the zac phase is pi and is not obstructed atomic limit um okay so what we then did in the paper is to explore few of the toy systems as of now we have seen a low energy model system and we went to few toy models of lattice models where this actual phenomena occurs and show that this indeed can be done and one such example is an anisotropic graphene so essentially you take a graphene lattice and introduce with the three, ne three nearest neighbors change your hopping term values with t1 t2 and t3 and this turns out to be an anisotropic graphene essentially you stretch your graphene in all the three directions you do 
And doing this turns out that you still preserve a symmetry. You lose your C6 symmetry and everything, but you still preserve one symmetry, which is a symmetry that's being passed that leaves a line invariant. This line invariant. This essentially takes your red to red, green to green, and leaves this red and green invariant. So this line preserving symmetry, and hence you can move your Dirac cone along these lines. And in fact, you have three such lines, this, this, and this, all your three nearest neighbor lines, which are being preserved. And you can move your Dirac cones through this. And based on the values of your T1, T2, and T3, we showed that your system can be in either phase one, phase two, phase three, or phase four, I essentially travel through all your four different phases. And second example that we went through is a pretty simple example that we designed, which is, uh, just take a 1D SSH model and translate into 2D, but not in a trivial way of connecting just the nearest neighbors over here, but rather connecting crisscross in a way that's crisscross in the XY direction. And this again creates a T1 and T2, which is the usual SSH term and a TX term, which is your crisscross term over here. And again, this system that you see over here can be traveled throughout your all your faces just by varying your T1, T2 and TX. And as you see, you have a Dirac cone over here. And in this phase, the edge state, or when you make a finite dimensional chain of the system, the edge state is, uh, is the one that connects the two Dirac cones that you see in between. While in the other state, even though you have the same Dirac cone, the edge state is the one that connects out of your Dirac cone. And then you have two kinds of insulators where you don't have a Dirac cone uh, at all, but the insulator that you see is one insulator where you have a complete edge state throughout your Brillouin zone that's being caused by your uh, discontinuity or your uh, branch cuts in your wave function throughout your Brillouin zone. But the other one where you don't have an edge state or just like in the SSH trivial case, you don't have. But note, both of these are still in the abstract atomic limit system where you have a non-trivial winding number. And they just differ by unit cell. Okay, so the big takeaway from this digression we had is that annihilating oppositely wound Dirac cones, or essentially when you have a topological charge of plus one and minus one of two Dirac fermions, and when you annihilate them, you are always guaranteed that you will result in an abstracted atomic limit or in a limit where your wave functions have a branch cuts in the system and not a trivial topology or just a smooth wave functions throughout your system. So this is the big takeaway from this paper that you see over here. Okay, now let's get back to the system we had where we had all the ingredients to do this. Essentially, we had a line preserving symmetry, which is the C2 symmetry. And we had an inversion preserving system where essentially all the atoms over here still satisfying inversion because the system belongs, even in the buckle case, belong to the D6H group. And thus, one can indeed move these Dirac points along the line preserving symmetries. And what one can actually do is annihilate them in pairs. And we do, we do show that once you go from the flat state to a slightly buckled state and keep on buckling the system, these Dirac points move as you see over here and finally annihilate and you have a system which is an insulator. And then you have two such Dirac cones and hence you have two such annihilations. And the system actually becomes a test bed for testing a real material system where you have a annihilation critical point with linear dispersion along one direction and a massive dispersion along the other direction. Um, okay, so from the previous talk, I mean, the, from the previous session, we saw that annihilating Dirac fermions doesn't lead to a trivial insulator, but rather an obstructed atomic insulator. And this indeed turns out to be true in the antimony system. As you see over here, once the Dirac points come over closer and merge at the gamma point, you are see here on the right-hand side, we plot the uh, 1D band structure of the system or a finite chain system. And you see the surface here that's being occurred. And instead of being a usual trivial insulator, this is an insulator where a surface state spans throughout your Brillouin zone, the 1D channel. And hence, this actually belongs to the abstracted atomic state of your insulator. Okay, how am I doing with time? Do what? Oh, you're on mute, Walter. Oh, you're on mute. Okay, so I guess if you could keep it to another 10 minutes and leave five minutes for All questions right. at the end. Awesome. Okay, so with 10 minutes, I'm gonna skip a lot of details over here, but the ultimate goal is to understand completely what's happening over here. So as of now, what we have seen is the system goes from a node aligned semi-metal to a Dirac semi-metal, which is protected by a mirror symmetry. And once you break the mirror symmetry, you still have a C2 symmetry that protects it and a Dirac semi-metal. And even though you completely still have a C2 symmetry that's protecting the Dirac cone, there is another way of destroying these Dirac cones or capping the system, which is by annihilating the Dirac cones in pan 
while passing through the C2 symmetry. And that's what happens when you buckle it and the system finally goes into the obstructed atomic insulator. Okay, so I'm going to skip this section of how to rigorously identify that. I mean, we did see that we have an instant that's pulled throughout your system, but there are other ways to rigorously identify how, why this buckled PX, PYPZ system is actually an obstructed atomic limit. One is to look at the actual charge density of the system, which I'll just go through because it's pretty simple. You just have to look at it. And the other is to actually calculate the ZAC and 1D very face of the system or use symmetry indicators to show that it's indeed an obstructed atomic system. So in the obstructed atomic system, we saw that the Vanier centers or the localization of the electron is going to be not on your atom, but rather on the bonds or in between your atoms. And if you actually plot the charge density of the buckled antimony system or the buckled PXPYPZ system of the occupied band manifold, you'll see that the charges are uh, localized on in between your bonds, which is what you expect because what you have essentially done is you have three P PXPYPZ orbitals or two sets of them, and you have made this system open up a gap and made it into an occupied band manifold and a non occupied band manifold, which is a bonding and anti bonding state. So the bonding state, the lower energy state is going to be occupied by the electrons in between your bonds, just like hydrogen atom or any kind of covalently bonded atom. And this is indeed the case. And this is a very easier way of seeing your system is actually an obstructed atomic limit. And interestingly, okay, I'm again going to skip this. This has very serious connections to how you extend the notion of SSH in case of 2D system or put an SSH design SSH model with alternating strong and short bonds in a honeycomb lattice. It turns out that the, uh, the antimony buckle system is exactly equal and topologically to the system that you see over here. And again, for further discussion, we have a complete discussion of how exactly these two are related in the paper that's given over here. And we can look at the symmetry indicators to show that these two systems, indeed, that you see over here are exactly equivalent to each other, which is you have an HP, your PXPYPZ orbital, which is in a buckle state is exactly topologically equivalent to another system, which is the Kekule system or the bond modulated graph, or again, a 2D generalization of your SSH model in honeycomb lattice. If you take these two systems together and look at their uh, eigenvalues, inversion eigenvalues, you will see that these two systems are equivalent with edge states or have the similar kind of edge states in their system. And hence, you go down to the usual description that your coffee cup is equivalent to a donut. Okay, so finally, I'll end with this short description where we actually show that the final state you end in is not just an obstructed atomic limit insulator, but rather a higher order topological insulator. And indeed, the way to look at higher order topological insulator is a bit complicated because now you go beyond your symmetries, which have two eigenvalues like inversion or uh, time reversal symmetry. It just has two eigenvalues to a more spatial symmetries, which has multiple eigenvalues. And C3 symmetries having three eigenvalues or C6 having multiple eigenvalues. And if your system is knotted or inverted with respect to these kind of inversions, then the way to detect it becomes a bit more complicated. And one needs to think of this in terms of sewing matrix theory. And there is a nice paper by Bell and Kansar where one can derive the different cases in terms of C symmetries and how to look at your eigenvalues and show if your system is knotted or not with respect to these kind of uh, C eigenvalues or your C symmetries. Uh, what we did is we extend the same C6, C6 symmetry to our buckle system, which preserves an S6 symmetry. And it's quite trivial to extend the same swing matrix theory to what we have. And it boils down to looking at eigenvalues of inversion and C3 symmetries at multiple inversion preserving point at C3 preserving point K. And what you predict from at the end of the day from all of this is that your system, when it's being knotted with respect to S6 symmetry, any S6 preserving part of your system, which essentially means an S6 preserving zero dimensional flake of your system is bound to have a corner charge that's given by E over two, which was pretty exciting because this says that the system is a higher order topology. And this, is the, this was at that time, the first example of a real material system having an higher order topology in two dimension. And to look at it, we constructed with our model Hamiltonian, a flake which is made up of, which preserves an X6 symmetry or essentially a C6 with kind of buckle. And look at the eigenvalues of these system. Since you have a finite dimensional flake or a finite dimensional system, you have discrete eigenvalues and you can look at the eigenvalues. And you'll see that you have 
six eigen values that are at a fermi level and these six eigen values are being shared by six of your corners and if you plot the real space representation of your eigen values you will see that all these six eigen values have a localized wave function which is being split by all your corners interestingly these kind of hexagonal flakes have been made for antimony in the paper that's given over here nature communication that's given over here and potentially someone could verify it and this again is a picture i'm going to skip but interestingly what you can see is the bonding and antibonding states that evolve as a function of uh, your finite dimensional system that you see and you have a bunch of bonding bonding states and antibonding states and a protected s6 protected surface or corner states that you just saw over here okay do we have time for final two slides or is sure sure okay so the last two slides i'm going to show us how we came up with another interesting paper to exploit the things that we have seen over here to make two interesting devices one which we dubbed the topological quantum switch which is a pretty interesting way because this system we saw that is a uh, obstructed atomic insulator with a band surface band throughout your system when you make a finite dimensional chain of the system and what you can do is since you have buckling and since this band is being protected by inversion symmetry you can apply an electric field through the system and break the inversion symmetry essentially by, because once you apply electric field the lower atom gets a positive potential or the other way around the upper atom gets a minus potential or the other way around i get confused but you see that you essentially break the on site terms between them and you gap the surface band that you see over here and since your fermi level is pinned between these two surface bands that you see over here after a certain threshold potential because of your uh, band dispersion you essentially create uh, you have a surface states charge current that goes on if you apply zero potential because you have fermi level pinned at your surface band and once you apply potential and split these two bands your conduction goes to zero because your system becomes a semiconductor or an insulator at this point hence one can use this as a quantum switch where you apply a small electric field to open and close a gap up making the edge conductance which are again quantized because you have 1d channel uh, into a discrete step so this is the idea of a topological quantum switch and the same thing happens even in the 0d flake and you can use the same thing and the second idea is another interesting idea where we create 1d conducting paths inside the system so again by using the same fact that we can break the inversion symmetry so since you break this inversion symmetry you can now create boundaries of atoms which have the same potential between them and what this turns out is that it turns out that you have a series of kp model or a double well or a well model where you have potentials throughout your system and you between the edge of those two systems you get a soliton like domain wall state between them and this belongs to a particular unoccupied band but if you dope the band with certain level of fermi level or whatever change you're doping you see that this band state is completely localized like a defect state in between the boundary that you have created by breaking the inversion symmetry and here is a plot of the real space wave function of this band and potentially one could imagine by creating different squares of this path and exactly traversing your 1d conduction channel wherever you want to go through okay finally as a last slide the things we have actually skipped is very interesting thing is how is this up atomic obstruction related to entanglement and we have used wilson loop to measure the degree of obstruction in these systems and secondly most importantly the dirac cone phase transitions that you saw between all those four phases why do we even call them phases and it turns out it's related the phase or the order of transition between those phases is related to the entanglement entropy of this system and one other part we have skipped is the transport and gonio polarity or very interesting kind of transport in these materials and finally the other thing we have missed is the effect of defects and robustness of the surface state but all these things that you have seen over here are completely detailedly explained in the papers attached over here so with that okay thank you um are there any questions how did you how did you study the robustness of the surface states Oh, the way we study the robustness of the surface state is uh, pretty rudimentary, actually, to the kind of sophisticated things you do. But what we do is we add random on-site defects to these system and random perturbation effects to these system numerically, and see how robust or how sustainable. After which point does the surface state break up or join the conduction and balance band? This is how we study the effects of the surface state with respect to defects.
a uh, nice talk. Thanks. Okay. Other questions? Um, oh, harsh. Sure. Yeah, I have a question. Um, uh, many questions, but maybe I'll ask one, uh, which is that in the flat band, do you have, um, if you go back to the flat system, sorry, the flat, uh, flat antimony. Oh, you don't have to go back. I, mean, I think you're, uh, I just oh, okay, okay. that. Um, oh, there, there might be quite strong spin orbit interaction. And did you take that into account? Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, in the paper, we did take it into account. And what you have ultimately with the spin orbit coupling is that you have a strong topological insulator. But all you see over here still survives, just that it becomes more interesting. And we have uh, studied that in the paper with the spin orbit coupling. But if you don't want to look at the spin orbit coupling in antimony, you can just go ahead and move up the ladder to arsenic. Mm -hmm. Well, even in arsenic, there would be spin orbits. Yeah. A bit small. <laughs> right. But yes. Yeah, and some of well, even higher. Have, some other people, <laughs> in fact, uh, discuss this phase transition. I mean, the topological nature of what happens if you add spin orbit coupling to these Dirac concept splits, yes. So that had been done prior to Santosh's work by, uh, I forget the guy's name now, he's at um, Austin University. Any other questions? Maybe I rushed Santos too much at the end. <laughs> yeah, I, I have a question. Hey, thank mm -hmm. you, Shirley. Um, <laughs> so it's a general question. So uh, in, in the map, right, uh, you, you show the, the higher order topological insulator. Um, and you showed that uh, you, you go from a Dirac uh, normal line, you break the mirror symmetry, you go, and then you become the uh, Dirac and um, then you can you can have this uh, abstracted atomic insulator. Um, I was wondering whether we can also have a higher order uh, Dirac semi-metal. Um, oh, yeah. Interestingly, this was dealt by Barry Badlin, which oh, not Barry Badlin, the guy who came in for previous seminar, uh, I forgot his name. So what they indeed showed is that you can have. Uh, you, you mean by higher order? Uh, do you just mean a simple Dirac metal, which is a resultant of a higher order topological insulator? Mm. I mean, that indeed is true for um, general three-dimensional higher order topological insulator where you have uh, edge states in a finite. So if you have a three-dimensional, here we saw the two, which is a very easy two-dimensional higher order topological insulator, where you go two times in your dimension and result in a zero-dimensional flake. Once you have a three-dimensional system and go two-dimensional less, uh, you have a 1D, 1D system where you have a 1D chain in your system. And in fact, you can go beyond that and have other higher order topological insulator uh, where you go from three dimensional system to a finite cube or something like that. And you have corner states passing throughout your system. And all these systems have indeed, except for the corner uh, 0D system, have 1D dispersion, which is given by Dirac cone for their uh, surface states. Okay. I think in in three dimensions, instead of corners, they call them hinges, right? Because it's called hinges, hinges yeah, 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 hinge state, yeah. So I, I had a, I had made a couple more questions. Can I ask those? Or, uh, oh yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, so one was just about uh, I slightly lost the thread towards the end. You had this domain wall that cropped up. Could you tell us a bit about what that wall is exactly? And oh yeah, so it turns out it's it's it's. it's actually a pretty trivial domain wall that you see over there. I was trying to show that it is indeed a solution to client states, but I kind of failed at doing it within the referee's stipulated time, but I hope one day I can do it. But essentially what you do is you have a bunch of, uh, it's a pretty simple defect like domain wall you see here because of the charge, oops, uh, charge you apply in this system, uh, which is made up of plus and minus charges. You, at the end of the boundary, you have a yellow atom and a red atom over here. So essentially you have two plus states or a two minus state together, which is followed by a, a series of plus minus plus minus. Mm -hmm. So here you are bound to have a defect domain wall, which mm -hmm. is either occupied if it is a minus minus potential or an unoccupied if it is a plus plus potential. And it turns out 
that's exactly what you see over here. And this can be neatly studied if you look at a 1D generalization of this 2D system, which is you have SSH model and add on-site potentials of plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, but suddenly break it and create a domain with minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus. You have two kind of ionic insulators that are being joined together. And that creates a defect of minus, minus, or a plus, plus, which we dubbed as wrongly a soliton or anti-soliton in this state or lower bound or up, lower energy level or upper energy level. And that's pretty much to the extent that we have understood what this domain wall is. Hopefully uh, one can understand this in terms of uh, general solutions to actual uh, domain wall states in some time. But if you look at the paper over here, we have indeed tried to understand this using a simple 1D SSH model with different onsite potentials and mapping it to KP uh, potential and then understanding it that way too. Let me just say that KP means chronic penny model. Oh. <laughs> so, so one thing, let me just add a comment. One thing which I'm still a little bit uncomfortable about it, and when Santos first told me about it, he immediately thought of this thing as a conducting channel. But to do that, if you just leave the system by itself, it would still be, you know, a uh, completely filled state, right? And you can have another one that's form a state near the conduction band. So if on top of that, we can somehow create doping by gating in the system, then we'd have a really interesting system where on demand, you could basically redraw circuits and make these conducting channels. Mm -hmm. um, but how well that will be realizable in experiment that we're still waiting for, of course. But this is very exciting, I think, because Previous ideas to make, there have been previous ideas to make, uh, you know, remarkable circuitry, but those involve like doing SDM manipulations on the surface to remove hydrogen or something on STO LEO. But here you could just imagine you have these pixels that he shows there, right? And just by where you apply positive and negative voltages in between them, you'll create these conducting boundaries if you are also able to dope it overall. So this would be a way to make rewritable circuitry. And non-destructive. So that's for once a really applied idea, I think that came out of it. So if there are no further questions. Um, I have another one. Oh, sure. Okay, you have, go ahead. So, so, so uh, at the beginning of the talk, you mentioned the uh, um, topology, the, the relation between the topology and, and whether the wave function can be represented in localized uh, winner, winner functions. So I wonder, uh, and you said for a topological non-trivial system, the wave function is not uh, uh, able to be represented by localized uh, winner function. I wonder, is that because of the uh, surface states? Yeah, indeed true. The, the reason is quite deep and that's the connection that you actually see with respect to Wilson loops that I mentioned over here. What essentially happens is uh, you can think of topological insulators as systems where your electrons or your centers of your electron when move throughout your Brillouin zone is bound to move from one unit cell to another unit cell picking up a phase. So if you try to localize this electron inside a single unit cell that preserves all your symmetry, you cannot do that because inherently that is what a topological insulator is. And if you plot the centers of these electrons as a function of your Brillouin zone K space, you'll see that the center moves from one unit cell to another unit cell, which indeed can be used as a, a band structure on its own. And topology on this Vanier center's band structure, which is actually the Wilson loops correspond to actually interesting properties of higher order topological insulators. Meaning topological properties of centers making the band structure and the corresponding topology of that determines the higher order topology of the system you're studying in. So there are pretty interesting intuitive connections between those two. And I don't think there has been a review yet connecting all these things together. It's all sporadically spread out throughout the literature. Okay. Well, I think to answer you house question, I would say that the surface states are not a cause of it, but rather a result of the whole thing. Okay. Yeah. Okay, if no further questions, let's thank our speaker again and wish him a good night. <laughs> thank you. Bye. So if you want to hang on, you can hang on. We can talk.